This podcast is brought to you by Pitcher, a curated platform offering both free and paid stock photography of Afrocentric communities. For more information, please visit pitcherstock.com. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to the second episode of Against Gravity with me, Henry Durban. This podcast is brought to you by Picha, and it's March. You know what time that is, the month for the celebration of achievements and strides made by women around the world. At Picha, we launched the Afrofem Collection. This is a free collection of photos amplifying the diversity, resilience, and beauty of black women that you can use for your storytelling, for your publicity purposes. So, you know, just go check it out at picturestock.com. Today on Against Gravity, we are privileged to have author, speaker, and leadership consultant, Mrs. Yawa hansen Kwao joining us. I'm so excited for this conversation because Yawa is a visionary executive director of the Emerging Public Leaders Program. She's also the founder of the Leading Ladies Network. You know, this is a non-profit that nurtures young girls and women for leadership and social entrepreneurship. You know, she's also served and continues to serve on the advisory board of the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers Community. She's also on the board of the Shasi University and the Women's Institute for Global Leadership at Benedictine University. Yawa seems like the right person to speak to as we highlight and celebrate the work of women this month across the world. I'm so excited. Thanks for joining us here on Against Gravity, Yawa. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, It's International Women's Day on March 8th and it's International Women's History Month. These are really two important uh, celebrations of women throughout the year to, you know, highlight their achievements, their works. For you, what does it mean, uh, International Women's Day? What day is it to you? Well, International Women's Day to me is a real opportunity to pause and reflect on how far women have come um, and to take an assessment of how much further we can go. I think, you know, the celebration this year, um, the theme is around women and leadership. So it really resonates with me, given my personal passions, which is to to help women unearth their leadership potential. I think that, you know, it's been encouraging to see so many companies and organizations over the years become very aware about some of the imbalances that exist between the genders. It's been great to see more and more women arise as public leaders. And so it's an exciting moment, I think, to number one, celebrate the women around us who are doing great things and to to set aside some stories for inspiration, but also to do the hard work of assessing how much further we should go. You know, as we are experiencing a global lockdown, you may have read some statistics around the increasing rates of domestic violence against women. You may be aware of some of the cultural practices that are still plaguing our society. So, you know, even in the spirit of celebration, there does need to be some sort of assessment and reckoning about what are the things that we need to do to continue to make the world a safe place for women and girls? And what are the things that we can do to amplify the progress that's been seen so that we don't forget um, or we don't leave behind this coming generation of women and girls. Now let's go straight into our conversation, Mrs. Yawa hansen Kwao. You've been called a global leader, a feminist, social entrepreneur, public speaker, change maker, and some of these are used to describe you. But in a minute, tell us in your own words who Mrs. Yawa hansen Kwao is. Well, Henry, I am a woman striving to be her best self. All of the wonderful titles that you've just mentioned are a function of my striving to, 
to unlock all of the gifts, all of the abilities that I have, and to leave a mark on the world. I really do think that it's important to point out that, you know, women are not a homogenous group. We have different aspirations, different goals, different dreams. And I think we're called to do different things in the world. And some of us will be in the public light and some of us will do our work quietly and privately. And that's valid too. I think sometimes when we're celebrating women, it's easy to put a spotlight on those of us who are a little more public facing and we appreciate it, but I don't want to overlook the women that are raising the next generation of leaders at home. The women who are behind the scenes supporting their spouses, their children, their communities, and making the world a better place through different means. I think that as we're celebrating International Women's Day, it's important to recognize that women come in different, in different shapes and sizes. We come with different assignments and different callings, and some of us are on the front line. But I want to um, take a moment to, to celebrate those who are behind the scenes and are comfortable behind the scenes and have ambitions to remain behind the scenes. God bless you for your work and for the things that you do to make the world a better place. And I don't think we say that enough. So I thought I'd, I'd put that out there as you, as you ask me what makes me me. Um, you probably have heard of me because I'm a little more public facing but there's so many nameless and faceless women that also deserve a word of gratitude. So I do want to be on the record as having appreciated and recognized them too. And I totally agree um, across the spectrum. There's so many people who are behind the scenes, really fighting for change, doing some of the most enormous work to ensure that things get better. So thank you so much for mentioning them and celebrating them. So if you're not striving to make the world a better place for women, for young people who are, you know, working their way to become leaders on a softer level, what would, what would we find you doing if you're not working? Any hobbies, interests? I really love to read. I enjoy books. I enjoy losing myself in a good book. I also enjoy dancing and singing. You know, when I was younger, I thought I was going to grow up and be a famous uh, singer. Ooh. So um, I sang in a choir and, you know, my younger siblings and I were part of a gospel choir and we took piano lessons and other music lessons, etc. And it was, you know, but I... It, who knew that my life would turn out a little differently? So maybe if I wasn't doing this, I'd, I'd be a singer, a performer of sorts, or a musician. Who knows? Whoa. Can I challenge you to sing at the end of this conversation for our listeners? Oh, no. As, as my good friend says, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, well, let's go back to, I, I read an interview of you in, uh, I think you had in October, somewhere 2016, you were on a girls' car panel. And on this panel, you spoke about when you were a child, you were bullied because of your deep, you know, supposedly manly voice and how you couldn't speak really good English. Tell us about that time in your young years and how that, have, that has affected or influenced you in any way. Well, Henry, growing up, my family, in case you cannot tell, I'm Ghanaian, but we lived in the U.S., so I learned how to speak English in the U.S., which explains the american accent. Um, but it, it was difficult growing up in a multicultural environment. And part of the difficulty wasn't just because I was a multicultural child with immigrant parents, but it was also partly because at school, you know, people used to ridicule me because of the sound of my voice. I had a very deep voice for a child. So oftentimes when I would raise my hand to answer a question, you know, there'd be snide remarks like, wow, she sounds like a boy. Ha ha ha. Is she sure she's a girl? She sounds like a boy. And over time, Henry, I started to mute myself. I started to resent what I sounded like. I started to resent who I was. And, you know, it didn't take time for me to just stop speaking altogether. 
So even in, if I knew the answer to a question in class, I would refuse to raise my hand. Even if I had something important that I should say or thought was important enough to say, I would decide to mute myself just because I was afraid of the ridicule and afraid of looking different or sounding different. So this is a really seminal story in my life because it was, it was after my parents noticed my change in behavior that my father had asked, you know, and we had a conversation that I think really set me up for the path that I'm on now. He challenged me to say, you know, why are you muting yourself? Why are you not talking or as much as you used to? And I said, you know, people are laughing at me and I am not sure that I want to go to school anymore or to, you know, learn with these other people anymore. And he said two things that really inspired my life's journey. The first thing he said was, you must never let people's laughter or their opinions of you stop you from doing what you are called to do. And the second thing he said was, you must never let people steal your voice. Your voice is what is your power. And he challenged me with a question. When you're in school and the teacher is calling the role of attendance, um, how do you announce that you're there? And I said, I use my voice and I say, present, sir, or present, madam. And he said, exactly. Without your voice, it's like you're absent. So muting yourself just to avoid the ridicule is essentially deleting yourself from being here. And I think that was such a powerful revelation for me as a young child to recognize that your voice is more than just a tool. It is the essence of your being. And so that's really what started my love affair with this idea of finding my voice and helping other women to find their voice too. And to use their voice as a tool to leverage it, to announce to the world that we are here, to stop playing small, to stop muting ourselves, and to say, I have something that needs to be said. I have the contribution to this world that needs to be shared. So that frames really my approach to women's leadership. That's why I'm passionate about mentorship, passionate about anti-bullying, because it can crush a soul when you don't have the right nurturing environment around you to unearth and unleash your talents. And I believe that there are just so many women and girls, but quite frankly, so many people men and women, who could use um, the, 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 the push and the provocation to start using their voice and leveraging their voice to make the world a better place. And as we think about the theme for International Women's Day, you know, that's one of the challenges I'd like to throw out to your listeners. What ways are you muting yourself? In what ways are you shrinking yourself just to fit? Or in what ways are you allowing other people's opinions to stop you from unashamedly pursuing your dreams and goals? Because you have so much potential, so much ability, so much to give, and there's no one else like you. So it's your job, your responsibility to live up to that potential by sharing it with the world. Amazing. Such a turning point in your life. And I want to thank your dad for having that discussion with you and really changing how you thought about, you know, muting yourself, not speaking to the amazing work you're doing today. And throughout all that, you were a political refugee. Um, I think you left Ghana in the 1980s during Ghana's military rule. Tell us how growing up as a political refugee in the U.S. was like for you leaving your home country to the U.S. to grow up, essentially. Quite honestly, I do not remember a lot about leaving the continent, what that felt like. I was too young. So it's my parents and my, you know, older relatives that paint for me a picture of what Ghana was like at a time like that. They talk about the difficulty 
of finding basic foodstuffs to buy. They talk about the military presence and the fear and the panic. They talk about how, you know, in those days, just your affiliation with the previous government was enough to get you killed or on a wanted list. So we, like many other families that were connected to the previous administration, had to leave the country. And like I said, I, I know these stories only vicariously because I was too young to remember. But what I do take from that experience is the importance of governance, the importance of having stability and peace in your own country. I don't think that people inherently grow up with the desire to live somewhere else. People run away from this continent in droves because of political instability, because of economic hardship, and they take the risk that my parents took to journey to an unknown land, to start living amidst unknown people because the risk of remaining in your home country is too great. So that does inspire some of the work that I do today as executive director of Emerging Public Leaders. We're working to fill the future talent pipeline with public leaders that are both ethical and competent that can steer the affairs of the nation and make good decisions and choices to deliver services to citizens so that no citizen would want to leave the country they're in and so that no one will have to flee it like we did years ago. So I don't really remember the feelings, the hardship of it, because thankfully our parents shielded us for most of it. But I do know that all things have somewhat worked together for our good. And the fact that we, our lives were spared, you know, my father told us the story of so many of his peers that unfortunately lost their lives during that period of time. Um, we, you know, again, are just so blessed to have escaped the, the worst parts of Ghana's history. And, been able to move to a country that had the resources to receive us and created space for immigrants to, to, to live and work and, and try to, to build their lives again. So I'm always, you know, indebted to, to those systems like the, and those organizations like the UNHCR that, that handles these refugee resettlements around the world so that political dissidents or political people who are seeking political asylum will have the opportunity to have a second chance because my family was definitely a beneficiary of this. And so I, I definitely now have, because of this experience, right. a multicultural right. background. And I think that that has its pluses. You know, I think I can fit in no matter where I am in the world because I know what it's like to be an outsider and not feel 100% like you belong. Right. And I think that that makes me a more effective leader because I can understand multiple perspectives. You are listening to Against Gravity with Henry Deben and our guest is Yawa Hansen Kwao. Yawa is helping many young people to find their voice and rise up in leadership in the public sphere. And uh, let's go straight to your university years. You came to Ghana years later, you attended the Shes University, which has been a critical part of your journey. There you made history as the first female to be elected president of a college level student government in Ghana. Reflecting on it today, how was that particular moment for you? Well, first of all, studying at Ashesi University has been one of the greatest honors of my life. I think the vision of the university to inspire a new generation of African leaders is exactly what the continent needs. And I'm honored to be among the first, you know, pool of, of applicants and graduates from Ashesi University. 
when I ran for student government, it was such um, a pivotal moment in my life. Again, with the history of muting myself and wanting my voice to be heard, wanting my ideas to be championed, and building the confidence in self to overcome those internal fears, it was not that I was trying to prove a point. I genuinely believed I had the best ideas and hoped that my gender would not really matter. So I feel very proud of that achievement to have been able to, you know, win an election that I contested for, but also to have made a bit of history so that other young women are today pointing to my example. I think that that's such a, a refreshing um, achievement and it's something that I greatly appreciate having accomplished. Definitely. You introduced the honor code back there in university where you sort of try to entrench ethical behavior, where rules and regulations were there, but the honor code, you know, makes people to voluntarily try not to do things that are wrong. Tell us, why is the honor code any different for people listening who don't know what it's about? Why is it different from the usual rules and regulations of a governing student in a university? Well, Henry, to understand the honor code system would require you to understand the type of training that Ashesi University provides. So over the four-year period of your undergraduate education at Ashesi University, as a student, you are taught or encouraged to contemplate this one question of what is a good society. You take leadership uh, courses throughout the four years that contemplate this fundamental question, what is a good society? So the Honor Code Initiative, you know, I cannot take full credit for it, in all honesty. There were several people who were championing this, and I was one of them. But the, it was our attempt at creating a just and fair and aspirational type of society on campus where you wouldn't be doing the right thing just because of fear of punishment, but that you would take the responsibility as a member of the community to act right and to do right and to report those that didn't do right so that our society would be inherently good. So the honor code, you know, during my presidency at a chassis, we introduced the idea, we had tons of student conversations about it. We also talked a lot about the pluses and the minuses of it. We had stakeholder consultations to see whether or not people really wanted to do it. But I believe it was the year after um, that it was actually implemented. So currently at Ashesi, the honors code system for all incoming students, you sign up to it, it's voluntary, and um, it means that, you know, you can take exams without an invigilator. It means that ethical issues are taken seriously. And it's just such an important way to create a society that values accountability and values ethics Great. Uh, you said in a Gaspin Global interview, and that quote really stuck with me, you said in too many situations, women's great ideas get drowned out by their own doubts and lack of confidence. Their dreams are quashed internally before they are quashed externally, because women through socialization and other factors don't naturally see themselves as leaders. And because of this, you switched from women's health advocacy to female leadership where you established the Leading Ladies Network. How has the Leading Ladies Network really changed the status quo of women so far? What impact have you made? Well, Henry, I really believe that every woman is a leader. I think that our job is to help women and girls to unearth the leadership potential that they already possess. And, you know, I had always been interested in women 
addictions, issues. And as you rightly said, I started out, you know, mainly from supporting women's health. So I was an HIV AIDS peer educator and I was alarmed by the fact that HIV AIDS was becoming a woman's disease. But when you unpacked some of the reasons why, it really had to do with lack of, of confidence. So for example, a young girl being propositioned by a man to you know, give her body as a sacrifice for her school fees, for example. Um, it, it boiled down to economics or the lack of confidence to assert herself and what she wants. Many women lacked even the confidence to ask their sexual partners to use condoms or other contraception. And so it wasn't just a health issue. It, it, to me, the issues around the HIV AIDS explosion among women was also a confidence issue and assertiveness issue. And these are some of the traits of leadership. And that's really what caused my pivot to women's leadership issues, to start really examining what are the things, the barriers. And some of those barriers, as you rightly referenced from my quote, have to do with how we're socialized. When we grow up in an environment where no one is expecting us to uh, express dissenting views or to, you know, to, to be aggressive in our pursuit of, of goals and dreams. In fact, when I was growing up, we had family members who would tell me that if I kept playing sports or being as aggressive as I was because of the sports I was playing alongside boys, that no one would ever marry me when I grew up. So imagine in, in your early teens being told that if you do not modify your behavior, you will not be liked and you will not be loved. And unfortunately, that is some of the overt and subliminal messaging that so many women and girls are bombarded with. But then there's a switching point where all of a sudden you're expected to be like this person and do like that person and succeed and be sexy and be smart and be articulate and be this. And there's an increasing amount of pressure that women feel bound by. And I think, you know, part of that is what keeps a lot of women away from public leadership. So the Leading Ladies Network was my attempt at creating a, a network that would provide the support and resources that would unleash women's potential as leaders, particularly in the public sphere. And since we were founded in 2010, so we celebrated our 10 year anniversary last year, we have had the opportunity to mentor thousands of young girls in the school system, junior high, high school, university. We have had the opportunity to train hundreds of professional women, getting them promotion ready, and work with different companies and organizations, helping them to um, boost the potential of their high achieving women so that more women could rise into leadership roles in their places of work. So I'm really proud of the work that's been done with Leaning Ladies Network. I no longer lead the organization on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm very encouraged to have been the convener and the founder behind this really important initiative. Thank you for establishing that because uh, we need more female leaders throughout the ranks of leadership. And you're currently the global executive director of the Emerging Public Leaders Program, which is training the next generation of leaders for public service. How has that journey been so far? If I, I think it's about two, three years now. And also how are these young leaders groomed? You know, what, what, what actually do you teach them as part of their program? Well, yes, I am in a new and exciting professional chapter. And as executive director of Emerging Public Leaders, it's been my honor to lead an organization that is so um, necessary in a time like this. We are working to get really talented young people into government service. We started in Liberia over a decade ago under our founder's leadership. 
and to take this vision and expand it to new countries has been such a great honor. We launched the program in Ghana in 2018 and so far have been able to recruit and place 60 fellows. We have a public service fellowship, so our beneficiaries are our fellows that are placed into different government agencies, and we provide training, mentorship, and other support to enable them to be drivers of change in public sector organizations. And it's important, Henry, because in the scheme of things, when I look at the continent of Africa and I see all of the great potential, I do believe that we are at a crossroads where more and more countries are beginning to come out of long-standing dictatorships. Of course, there are a few exceptions. Um, but the next frontier is the building of strong state institutions that can efficiently deliver services to citizens. And you cannot build strong institutions of state without great talent. And regrettably, most of the most highly educated Africans do not see civil service or public service institutions as viable career options. And so through our initiative, we are creating a clear merit-based pathway for the best and brightest talent in Ghana, Liberia, and soon to be in Kenya, the opportunity to work in government institutions and drive change there so that some of the great talent that gets lost to private sector can come into the public sector institutions and improve service delivery in general. And I think this is an important recipe for helping to create an Africa that is peaceful, prosperous, and just. And I agree with you. Um, we cannot have strong institutions without good competent talent, I totally agree with you. But with the graduates that emerge from the Emerging Public Leaders Program, no pun intended, I'm thinking they are going into the civil service, they are going into the public sector, where we know there is so much corruption, there is this like a daisical attitude to work. You know, what, what are they reporting to you as a feedback? What is the pushback from these graduates when they enter the public service after graduating your program? Well, public service is a high calling, Henry. And I am so proud of the fellows that have graduated from our program and who are now full-time government employees. Working for government is a whole different ball game for sure. It's not the easiest place to thrive, but it is the place that makes the impact that brings innovation to scale. It's the sector that enables policies that will affect the way that my children and your children's lives take. They're the ones who are responsible for that. And thankfully, through the two years of the fellowship training and mentoring that we provide, our fellows gain a deep sense of patriotism, a deep sense of personal responsibilities. They are trained and competent. They are also ethical. And so they have all of the skills necessary to set them up for a very successful public service career. And thankfully, they deliver great work, which means that they, be, they have become quite valuable in the departments and agencies to which they've been assigned. And therefore, that continuing professional support that we provide them post-fellowship is enabling many of them to continue to thrive in spite of the inadequacies of the system. Additionally, there are a lot of public servants that are not corrupt, that are ethical, that are doing the right things. And we are deliberate about bringing them into our fold. Through the Public Service Fellowship Program, we're creating these intergenerational mentoring relationships where our fellows can learn from the best and the most brightest and the most successful public servants so that the, only the best traits are being passed along. And when there are issues, they have trusted people with whom they can navigate the system with. So I am confident that we have a model that works 
and should be replicated across Africa. And it's my personal honor to be leading this charge through emerging public leaders. Yawa, uh, one thing I've noticed, I don't know, uh, so many people also agree with me, people I've spoken to about this. We get people who are well-trained business leaders in the private sector. They're really good, they're really top-notch. The enter political power and all of a sudden expectations and outcomes are completely different. Whatever expectations you have of them to go in there, deliver the social change, deliver what you need, it doesn't really come out as such. So it looks like my question is, are these principles, values people uphold really realistic when you're in political partisan power, when you're supposed to tow a certain party line at times. What's your observation of this trend? Well, Henry, I cannot speak for individuals and their choices, but I, I do want to say two general things. Firstly, I believe that this process that we initiate through emerging public leaders that sends cohorts of leaders into public service at a time is an important frame. You know, they say little drops of water evaporate. But when you have other drops with you, that's when you become a mighty ocean. So every year when we're recruiting and placing cohorts of fellows, they become a great support system to themselves. And I think that that's part of what makes this model important. When you have a community of like-minded people who are also striving to live up to the standards of competence and eloquence and, and ethics, rather, it makes a world of difference in how you maintain your integrity, how you maintain a sense of self. When you have an organization that exists to support you um, and, and is working to train and mentor and coach you and to facilitate these mentoring relationships with others who can help you, I think it, it really changes the odds and the outcomes. So I do think it's an important consideration to explore how we bring not just individuals, but cohorts of excellence into public service institutions. The second reflection is that I also believe that, you, you know, you make a mistake, in my opinion, if you equate politics with governance. And I, I really want to draw the distinction here. I really think that, that we have an opportunity to transform governance, how nations are governed. And, you know, the politics is a pathway through which people receive a mandate to govern. But governance structures uh, go way beyond the politician. And I think that that's a useful distinction for citizens to draw that as much as it's important and it's critical to vote for your political leaders, of course, your, your parliamentarians, your president, etc. I, you know, change happens at district levels, at community levels, and your assembly members and all of that. And so I, 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 I would encourage people to start looking at the frame of governance, that how do we get people technical experts into the right positions, people that have an understanding of what the issues are, not people who are being placed just because of their political affiliation or because of their um, usefulness in helping to have one political power. So drawing that distinction between politics and governance is also an important frame that I want to you know, shine a light on as well, because I think that that will help take away some of the apathy, that you can't just write it off. The government sector cannot be bypassed. It, you know, governments are necessary partners to help drive innovation and to set the regulatory framework. So my focus 
and what I encourage others to, to lend their focus to as well is how do we get people of competence and high moral standards into governance systems, into institutions that are delivering um, public goods. And I think that if more citizens are able to differentiate the politic from the governance question, then it may enable us to, to, to adopt approaches that get the right people into the right jobs. Powerful. This is still Against Gravity with Henry Deben. Today I'm speaking to Mrs. Yawa Hansen Kwao. She's the Global Executive Director of the Emerging Public Leaders Program. She's helping young women and young leaders to strive to break through to the top and create the much needed change we want. Now let's go to the final leg of our conversation. And it's still March, International Women's History Month, International Women's Day, Achievement Celebrations of Women as front and center. Another really important thing I want us to look at is feminism and the movement to ensure gender equality. I mean, I follow debates on social media, especially Twitter, for Ghanaian and Nigerian spaces. And there's this fierce debate about feminism, you know. Most of the times people brand feminists as angry, aggressive, you know, and Christian, they are divorced, you know, they, you know, they have dislike for men and are intolerant. Yawa, what are people getting wrong about feminism and your response to these perceptions people throw about on Twitter and Facebook at times? So Henry, I like to look at the work of feminists and activists under the umbrella of change. Change is tedious. It's uncomfortable. And when your work invites people to change the way they think, to change the way they choose, to change the the way they behave, it comes with resistance. So I'm not at all surprised that with every change effort, there is backlash. So feminism isn't different in the sense of it being a change effort. We're advocating that people question self, question their choices, and that's uncomfortable because it forces you to come face on with a reality or with choices that you've made in your past, maybe, that, that make you feel uncomfortable. So change is tedious. It, it re- involves discomfort. And regrettably, some of that discomfort gets felt by the people who are initiating the change. So my words of, of encouragement would be to the change makers that if you believe with all your heart the mission that you're on, keep at it. Change is tedious. Not everyone will like you. But because women years ago made a lot of noise, were branded with unpleasant names, some were killed and vilified, I have the right to vote today. That's not in question. And in like, in, in similar fashion, because of the tedious work of change that feminists are doing today, my daughters and their generations will take for granted, will have an opportunity to take for granted some things that, you know, today we feel are big deals. So I'm not worried by it at all. In fact, I'd be surprised if people weren't upset by the activism, because in many ways, that's evidence that you are doing a good job. (laughs) When you're doing the work of change right, you will make some enemies. There will be some people who think, who the heck do you think you are? And it's because you're called to challenge 
old ways of doing things challenge systems. And it takes a unique skill set to do that. So my words would be to the change agents to take care of self. Self-care is critical. That you have to create a mental, spiritual, and psychological environment around yourself to keep yourself encouraged. You have to, because it will be grueling. It's like you're on a battlefield. But I think that it's because of the sacrifices of those who dared to demand change that we have the rights today that we take for granted. So I'm not phased by it at all, Henry. Great. Uh, on this podcast, we have the Against Gravity Moments. And here our speakers or our guests share their biggest Against Gravity Moment. This could be your biggest hurdle or resistance that you've faced in your life or career and how you surmounted it. So, Yawa, please share your Against Gravity Moment with us. Henry, I had so many moments in my career so many moments in life in general that I have felt depleted and unable to keep moving. Um, in my recent history, it was the birth of my second son, my second child, my, my son, Derek. He was born early and unwell and was later diagnosed with a rare medical condition. I you know, happened to, to be in a different country away from my husband and immediate family members and really struggled with the panic and the fear of this diagnosis and, you know, the, the uncertainty of whether my child would live or die. So I have to say that I really, really, my life stopped. I could no longer work. My son was hospitalized. I was by his bedside. He wasn't expect to live, expected to live more than two weeks. And um, by God's grace, he turned three years old a few months ago. I share that because for me, that's been one of the biggest journeys of faith journeys of resilience and journeys of having to push aside how I'm feeling and focus on how I can keep moving on in spite of the hurt that I feel. You know, I can't remember another time in my life when I had felt so powerless to see someone that you love so dearly suffer and not be able to do anything to relieve their pain. But there's something about adversity that forces you to dig deep into the recesses of your soul and your spirit and bring out the good stuff. So what that meant for me was me digging deep into my faith like I had never dug before to contemplate what does my faith teach me about moments like this and to dig in to the truths that are in the word of God in a way that I had never dug before and affirm those truths over my life, over the life of my son and over my future. So I have learned so many lessons that I am still unpacking three years on. And for those who know me closely, they know that my son is still on a long medical journey, but he is a living miracle. The fact that he's made it this long, the fact that he recently started preschool, which is something that we were told never to expect, is proof of how when adversity strikes, you have two choices. Do you fold in and just say, oh my God? Or do you dig deep and say, oh, not today, not me. And I am learning that no matter what the circumstance, if you come 
to your problems with a mindset of I can get through this and I will get through this, then the fact is you shall get through it. So I believe that that is just one of the most seminal or, 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 or the most significant uh, blockages and, and, and barriers that I have had to surmount. And I thank God for the grace to, to do so and to still function and to not, you know, be overwhelmed by the feeling of it all. And there's so many life lessons that I'm still unpacking for myself. But I share that because for those listening, you may be going through a moment that feels insurmountable. And I want to encourage you to note that you are made of good stuff. God who made us put in us a capacity to overcome things that ideally should kill. And you should be digging into the deepest recesses of your soul and spirit and bring out all of that so that you can withstand whatever life has thrown at you. So I share that to encourage you and to say that for those of you who, you know, I'm a Christian and I know not everyone who's listened listening may accept my faith as truth but I have found that when you dig into the word of God and you accept that word as truth and you affirm that truth over your life verbally on a regular basis it changes your own mind it changes your perspective and it empowers you to stand in the midst of what should be a storm that overtakes you so that's what I would like to share today is just one of the most recent big hurdles that I have had to leap over. And I'm grateful because I'm seeing the evidence of how when you refuse to be relent, to, to relent in your pursuit, it pays off. Wow. Thanks for digging in and sharing this inspiring part of your life with us. I am inspired and I know so many people going through similar situations will get up their loins, find their faith and push through. Finally, Yawa, for any young girl listening out there, any young person who wants to be a leader, who is scared and afraid to speak up, scared to take on the opportunity that may lead them to the next big thing, scared to you know, apply for something that they surely know can take them to the next level? What are your parting words to these people? You make a mistake if you wait to feel like you are ready. Have the boldness to do it even if you're afraid. And the other fact that I'd like to leave is that you cannot be your best self by yourself. We were not created to be islands. You will not be able to accomplish anything of great and lasting value by yourself. So stop being an island. Ask for help. Ask. Ask for help. Pray for help. Pay for help. Some of you may need coaches and counselors. You may need mentors on your journey. Ask for it. Pray for it. And pay for it. Because your, your future is worth it. You are worth it. You can't be your best self by yourself, so don't be an island. Look for peers and colleagues, people to agree with you, people to partner with you. And you will find that you can often get where you're going much, quick, much more quickly if you would have the humility to partner with others. So those would be my parting words. And I pray God's blessing over everyone who's listening. And I pray that God will help you to unashamedly pursue your dreams and your goals. I am cheering you on. God bless you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Yawa Hansen Kwao. She is the Global Executive Director of the Emerging Public Leaders Program. Really inspiring conversation and happy International Women's Day to you. Thank you 
we're ensuring that every girl in Ghana has equal opportunity to live up to their full potential. And also the challenges that women face, the barriers and all of these hurdles are surmounted and dealt with. Thank you so much for being on Against Gravity. We are really honored to host you. Thank you for having me, Henry. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to Against Gravity. We are powered by Picha, your Afrocentric visual content provider. Don't forget, you can access all the episodes of Against Gravity on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Castbox. Remember to check out the Afrofem collection of images showing the diversity of Black women as we celebrate Women's Month this March. Use these images for your storytelling for positive impact. Happy International Women's Day to you, every woman listening. I would want to end today's episode with a quote from our guest, Yawa. And this quote goes this way. Don't let people steal your voice. Your voice is your power. Don't let people steal your voice because your voice is your power. Thanks for listening to Against Gravity. Thanks for sharing your time with us here on the show. Bye for now.